Officials in charge of Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have a new controversy on their hands. They've dis disclosed another leak of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Workers first discovered the problem nearly a year ago, but Tokyo Electric Power waited until now to make the information public. NHK World's Jun Yotsumoto has more. We made the announcement now because we have confirmed that the water is considered to be relatively highly radioactive. TEPCO officials say workers have discovered a pool of water on the roof of the number two reactor building. They say highly radioactive material inside the reactor had made the water contaminated. The officials say the water flowed from the reactor building through a drainage channel and spilled into the Pacific Ocean. They've admitted that they knew about it as early as last April. TEPCO executives say there has been no change in the amount of radioactive substances in seawater near the plant. A TEPCO official told NHK the company has now stopped the leak by putting devices that soak up radioactive substances inside the drainage channel. Dealing with toxic water is a constant challenge at the plant. Groundwater seeps into reactor buildings damaged in the March 2011 disaster. About 350 tons of it accumulates every day. TEPCO has set up about 1,000 tanks to store the water, but once they fill up, the company will have little space to add more. The company came up with a way to work around that. Workers would pump up groundwater, treat it, and then discharge it into a port attached to the plant. Officials have been trying to convince local fishermen to agree to the proposal. On Wednesday, they met with the leaders of the local fisheries cooperative to apologize for the latest leak. We are truly very sorry for the worry and trouble we've caused the fishing industry. Why didn't you tell us honestly about what was going on when you knew about it since last year? We can't trust you anymore. Since the disaster four years ago, TEPCO's executives have said rebuilding ties with local communities is one of their biggest priorities. But they've come under harsh criticism for the way TEPCO has handled contaminated water. People have also lost trust in the company for being slow to share information. Now, news about the latest leak is further undermining people's goodwill and fueling a fresh backlash. Japan's government has made some progress in dealing with the growing amount of radioactive soil in Fukushima. The governor and the mayors of two towns say they'll approve shipments of contaminated soil to intermediate storage facilities to be built in the prefecture. I decided to allow radioactive soil and other waste to be brought into the towns. The goal is to clean up the environment and recover from the disaster as soon as possible. Uchibori and the mayors of Futaba and Okuma towns expressed their consent when they met the environment minister and reconstruction minister. 
The central government plans to build the facilities in the towns to store soil and other waste from decontamination work following the 2011 nuclear accident. The towns also host the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant. Government officials say shipments of the waste are scheduled to begin by March 11th, the fourth anniversary of the earthquake and tsunami. But the date is not firm. The mayor's demanded shipments should start later than March Chinese 11th. Chinese tourists are heading to northern Japan for a local delicacy. Sea cucumber is a popular food in both countries. But the tourists are snapping what they say is a tastier and cheaper variety. NHK World's Miki Yamada reports. Mutsube in Aomori Prefecture is known for its sea cucumber, and winter is the peak season. In China, sea cucumber is priced as a gourmet food. People also like its health and beauty benefits. It can be simmered, sautéed, or cooked in a variety of other ways. Wealthy Chinese people like Japanese sea cucumber because it has thick flesh. In search of sea cucumber. Five wealthy families from the north of China have come to Aomori on a gourmet tour to sample the local delicacy. They also hope to take some home. Aomori sea cucumber is not well known in China, so the city has organized this tour to promote their product. The first stop, a local Chinese restaurant. It often serves Aomori sea cucumber. The dried sea cucumber is soaked in water. Sea cucumber from the bay is thick and firm, which makes it a good variety. It is sautéed or simmered with spinach and pork. The dishes are served. The visitors love the texture of the Aomori variety. I've eaten many kinds of sea cucumber, but this is the best one ever. On day two, the tourists visit a plant where sea cucumber is processed. Here, some cod in Mutsu Bay are dried. The tour members capture it all on their cameras. After being dried for three months, the delicacy is stored in this room. The visitors show a keen interest. They ask how old the sea cucumbers are and how many are in a 500 gram bag. In China, a kilo of the dried Aomori specialty is sold for about $3,000. But on this tour, visitors paid half that amount. This woman bought a kilo as a present for her family. Much better than what the Chinese sell for the same price. Chinese people like our product because of the bumpy surface. I think with good publicity, Aomori sea cucumber could become an international brand. Aomori city officials have high hopes that gourmet tours like this will lead to more exports to China of their local delicacy. Four sporting institutions from Asia have agreed to work together to boost the competitiveness of athletes in the region. Among them, officials of the Japan Sport Council have a special goal. They want to develop the capabilities of athletes ahead of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Representatives from Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore and Qatar signed the deal in Tokyo. The group will promote exchanges of information and people to improve the training of talented athletes and cultivate leaders. The exchanges will also cover sports medicine and scientific research. The members plan to call on China, South Korea and other Asian countries and territories to participate. The officials from the Japan Sport Council say they hope to learn from other participants. I think it's an important theme to raise the level of athletic competitiveness across Asia. We want to contribute to this point. 
Officials hope exchanges of young athletes will help them gain international experience. They say Singapore hosts many coaches and researchers from around the world, while Qatar and Hong Kong place priority on training junior athletes. Japan's Prime Minister is drawing on the help of experts to pen a statement that will be closely viewed around the world. Shinzo Abe is following in the footsteps of his predecessors to issue a declaration to mark the anniversary of the end of World War II. I want to consider what contribution Japan should make for the Asia-Pacific region and the whole world. I want to discuss with all of you what kind of nation Japan aims to become in the future. Former Prime Minister Tomichi Murayama started the practice in 1995, marking 50 years since the end of the war. He expressed feelings of deep remorse and offered a heartfelt apology for Japan's aggression in Asia. On the 60th anniversary, then Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi sent a similar message using much of Murayama's text. World leaders will be watching to see if Abe uses similar expressions in his speech. His panel of academics and business leaders will discuss five points. They'll focus on the path taken by Japan and the rest of the world in the 20th century and what lessons can be drawn from the past. And they'll look into the future to offer a vision of Asia in the 21st century. Panel members say they'll complete their report by early summer. Abe will issue his statement in Thousands August. Thousands of people rallied on Sunday in Japan's southern Okinawa prefecture. They were protesting against a plan to construct a U.S. base in a coastal area. Japan's government plans to relocate the U.S. Marine Corps of Tenma Air Station from a densely populated area to the Henoko District in Nago City. Preparations are now underway for an offshore drilling survey. It's part of a plan to reclaim land for the new base. Protesters have been demonstrating outside the gate of U.S. Camp Schwab, which is adjacent to the planned relocation site. Members of the Diet and the Prefectural Assembly organized Sunday's massive rally. They say more than 3,000 people took part. We citizens have to exercise our collective power to counteract the powerful force of the central government. Protesters demanded the offshore work be suspended. Earlier in the day, two members of a civic group were detained by the U.S. military for entering the camp. They were later handed over to Japanese police who arrested them on suspicion of trespassing. About 300 people gathered in front of the Nago police station to demand their release. Rapidly evolving technology is making it possible to identify people based on their body parts. Japanese companies are driving innovation in the field. NHK World's Miko Suzuki takes a look at the front lines of identification technology. The most common means of identification are photo ID cards and passwords. But the use of biometric data is making identification easier and more secure. Some smartphones recognize the owner's fingerprint. Last month, Japanese electronics maker Hitachi unveiled this security gate. Just a touch of the hand is enough to verify your identity. And you can walk through without even stopping. The system quickly recognizes people based on vein patterns in their fingers. It's a highly accurate means of identification, but past systems needed too much time to process data. This one can verify 70 people in just one minute. A 3D scanner pinpoints the location of the hand. At the same time, infrared lights scans veins in the hand. The system works regardless of the position and shape of the hand. The system recognizes people based on their fingers, so it's extremely accurate. We believe it could be used at the gates at train stations. Japan is a leader in the field of vein recognition as well as other forms of biometric identification. Last year, 
the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology named Japanese company NEC as the developer of the world's most outstanding facial recognition technology. The company developed a system that compares scanned data with more than 3 million facial images per second. It's 99.7% accurate. This is a picture of me seven years ago. This photo data has already been registered in this computer. If a face matches a registered image, an identification number appears. Now let's see how it works. Oh, it recognizes me right away. The system recognizes faces despite changes over time and different facial expressions. This means it can match people with older images, such as passport photos. People who have not been registered in the system are identified as unknown right on the spot. The major selling point is the system's flexibility. It can recognize faces even if the angles change. People don't always look straight ahead. When they turn their heads, smile or frown, their facial expressions change. The system not only pinpoints the location and angle of a face, and also recognizes detailed facial features such as the shape of the nose or mouth. The technology is already being used by immigration officials in Hong Kong and Shenzhen, southern China. At concert venues, it quickly verifies tens of thousands of visitors registered to attend an event. The developers are working on making it possible to link scanned faces to personal data. They also plan to use facial recognition to make shopping easier. With these new advancements, one day we may never have to worry about forgetting our passwords. The stuff of science fiction is quickly turning into reality, but this reality may be more ominous than we think. They lived only to face a new nightmare the war against the machines. Meet Google's latest robot, who's been named Spot. It's been developed for the Pentagon, that wanted a robot to detect and track, quote, non-cooperative behavior in humans in pursuit or evasion scenarios. Spot is more agile than its predecessors and can run around at high speed both outside and indoors. It can also quickly recover from being kicked. Well, let's bring in technology and engineering expert Dr. Katina Michael for more on this one. So this is, hello to you, thank you for joining us on RT International, we really appreciate your time. So this is the latest robot, it's apparently autonomous and can detect non-cooperative subjects. How does it do that? It's uh, filled and packed with a whole bunch of sensors, uh, actuators and ability to move very quickly. Uh, how does it do that in actual fact? Well, it looks at voice information, uh, biometric information, visualization data, and matches that with a database. Uh, for example, the disposition matrix, uh, potentially in the future, looking at how to create crime lists or kill lists, for that matter. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it could be used in battle, I suppose. But what about when it comes to maybe controlling um, protesters? Could that work? Uh, it could certainly work. But whether we want to go that way is another, and is another story. Um, we're moving towards an evidence-based evidence policing approach where we want to collect as much data as we can for crowd control purposes and really it's about surveillance and identifying people in crowds using biometric technologies. So do we really want that kind of crowd control? I don't think so. I think it's a massive violation of human rights human dignity and of course privacy not to mention many more things well not to mention the danger i mean presumably that could be extremely dangerous to go of after course. protesters uh, i mean these things can make mistakes uh i've reported very, very often ah we seem to have lost connection so with can... katina just there katina we have a bad line so we're going to leave it there but thank you so much indeed uh for that Technology and Thank engineering you. expert, Dr. Katina Michael. Do we have connection? Hello? 
Katina, we're just trying to get the connection back for you. Bear with us for just one second. Oh, uh, indeed we do. Excellent. Modern day technology. Um, ironic that we're talking about this in particular. So let's get back to that and how they could be used pragmatically then. So how could they be used and what scenarios would they be used in and what kind of reaction do you think that they would, would have in reality? I think potentially we're looking at law enforcement agencies using these uh, technologies, these machines, these autonomous robots uh, for crowd control and many other purposes, but there are many unintended consequences of doing so. Uh, machines are not people and they do make mistakes. After all, they are programmed by humans. Absolutely. I, I always remember the horrors of um, Robocop. I think it's Robocop 2. I always remember that hideous. Um, now, how far is it that they will be armed? Well, we already have militarized versions of Boston Dynamics' big dog. It's called the LS3. The LS3 stands for the Legged Squad Support System. And these things have payloads up to 180 kilograms. They can't be tripped. Uh, they have a location gaze, a bit like a, an animal. And so they're already militarized. My concern is when we demilitarize them or we commercially introduce them into different sectors like policing and even other things like uh, security systems for security in car parks. It's a bit like introducing the Dalek. Uh, we've got Nightscope's autonomous data collection system that looks exactly like a Dalek, and now Petman, which looks exactly like a Cyberman from Doctor Who. So you're quite right. Science fiction uh, is actually coming alive. Absolutely. It does sound a bit like a Hollywood movie in a way, but it's reality. It's scary. All right. Thank you so much indeed. Technology and engineering expert, Dr. Katina Michael. We really appreciate your time.